and thanks for joining to this Knowhouse webinar called Deep Learning Computer Vision on a Cortex-M7 with CMSIS NN. Uh, my name is Martti Viljainen. I'm country manager in Finland and also in this webinar is our FAE Kalev Ratsunas who does the presentations. And uh, next about agenda. So I have a short talk about benefits of MDK, MDK Kyle environment for Cortex M development. After that, Kalevi continues with short introduction to computer vision with machine learning. And then we have a cool demo by using STM discovery board running machine learning computer vision model. And if you have any questions during this webinar, please type them to the chat box so we go through them in the end of this webinar. And uh, so MDK is comprehensive development environment that is supported and maintained by ARM. And it's especially suited for Cortex-M development but not restrict, restricted on these devices. It supports all Cortex-M devices and is independent of chip vendor and enables quick start for your application development. It includes all essential tools uh, like user-friendly IDE, debugger, simulator. It has Packet Manager that enables quickly to build application from existing software components. There's ARM cross compiler for C, C++ code, and it generates very optimized code in terms of size and speed. And this compiler toolchain is also qualified, qualified for functional safety development. Software packs gives flexibility and are simply maintained. Device packs abstracts low-level drivers and makes changing a device easy. CMC's framework packet includes uh, common APIs and libraries, for instance, for DSP math and neural network processing. Additionally, the middleware libraries that include easy networking and IoT connectivity, GUI builder and, and uh, other libraries like file systems, USB. And uh, then there are several debug hardware probes so that you can debug your device. Ulink Pro is useful if you need real-time ETM trace out of your device. You can use that for performance and code coverage analysis, for instance. Ulink Plus supports measuring power consumption for low power devices. Ulink 2 is a more or less traditional debug adapter. So you can set breakpoints and, and uh, do run control. And MDK is coming in, in four editions. The professional edition is the most comprehensive, including the largest device support and all the middleware libraries. Also, it comes with compiler qualification kit for functional safety. If you don't have functional safety project, plus edition is uh, proper. Uh, it comes without ARM version 8 architecture support, and it doesn't have all the IoT connectivity libraries. HSL edition is 
good choice if you don't need any middleware uh, and uh, it supports only cortex m devices in non-secure mode and finally light edition is free that you can try out immediately and it supports compiling up to 32 kilobyte images so um, this was the introduction for development environment that is used also building up machine learning application that Kalevi will show and, and now I will hand over to Kalevi so he can continue with the next topic. Hi, I'm Kalevi Rachunas. I'm here to give you a demo on the on the um, STM board. But before that, we'll just talk about in general about uh, deep learning related to computer vision. Also take a peek at um, uh, the Kyle tool itself and look at the um, neural network code. Uh, but I'll start with a um, more high level explanation of, of what um, deep learning in the computer vision context has brought to the field. So you, you may have seen this type of um, concentric circles with um, artificial intelligence having subparts such as machine learning and, and deep learning being a subset of machine learning. Um, what is not typically drawn in this type of um, uh, explanations or presentations is this representation learning um, circle that I have. And I'm trying to explain to you that uh, give you an intuition of how how this works in the context of deep learning. So in the middle of the slide you'll see a picture of a person and that, um, that image is uh, put into the neural network where the input of the network is, is at the bottom and at the top you get the output of of that image. And uh, this is a so-called classification problem. So at the top, you'll see this image being classified of one of three labels, uh, car, person, or animal. Uh, so what I really want to show out of this, um, this neural network is that you, you see different representations being learned at different layers of the neural network. And uh, that's the representation learning. Uh, which I'll look at a little bit more uh, closely on the next slide. So I'm trying to distinguish here between machine learning and, and deep learning so that you can appreciate what, um, what deep learning has brought to the field of computer vision. So on the top, we're explaining how an input image of a car uh, would first go through a person doing a feature extraction and then going through a neural network where the classification happens and uh, the output of that network would be uh, this image being classified as a car or not a car. And how deep learning has changed this field is where uh, the input image is passed into a neural network and uh, the classification happens similar to as on the top. Uh, there is no human needed feature extraction required as part of um, the network learning what is essential about the input. So th this has been around for quite a long time. And, and the reason deep learning has been such a success in the, let's say, last five to eight years is um, the amount of data available has made deep learning perform uh, better than traditional learning algorithms. So what has also been part of this revolution is the, the availability of compute power along with data so that training networks doesn't take months uh, due to um, the GPUs being really good at uh, training the networks. So th this is to give you a high level overview. Uh, if this seems a little bit strange, I, 
I, I don't expect you to uh, fully understand how this all works based on a um, short webinar, but to give you a little bit of a feel of, of how this might, might work. So on this slide, I'm, I'm trying to show you that there's a lot of different computer vision data sets available. The traditional one that most people run into beginning of their journey of learning about uh, deep learning is the AMNIST data set, which consists of um, handwritten digits uh, ranging from zero to nine. And uh, this has been used uh, in the US Postal Office for tens of years uh, for reading zip codes. Um, the ImageNet data set on the upper right hand corner uh, is a um, one which uh, in 2012 really changed the field with a network called AlexNet and uh, it brought um, wider attention to what deep learning could bring to the field. In uh, the data set that we're using for this demo is called SciFar 10 and uh, it's um, it has 10 different um, uh, classes available and you can and I'll switch to the next slide which zooms a bit in so airplane to truck um, there's 60,000 images in the data set uh, so 6,000 in each category uh, during training time 10,000 are, are set aside for the validation um, so th this is the actual images used in the data set and um, they seem a little bit blurry because they are 32 by 32 pixels uh, which is also the resolution will feed it in when, when we're running the network so so based on that uh, it's um, amazing that this works all together So, trying to give you a high level of what a um, what is a regular neural network versus a convolutional neural network on, on a very quick overview. So, so this model that we're going to see a demo of will be running the network on the bottom. Uh, traditional regular neural networks are so-called fully connected networks where there's an input and an output layer and, and one or more hidden layers and these hidden layers um, uh, each neuron or weight would connect to each um, neuron on the next level so there's a lot of connections and and each of these connections are our called uh, parameters and the more you have the more expensive the, the calculation is so on the bottom the convolutional neural network takes a different approach where there's a sliding window looking at smaller sections of the image and um, the image is also treated as, as three different um, images the, uh, the red green and blue um, layers are, are treated separately so um, there's also some um, uh, re reducing of the dimension of what we're searching in the image to to find uh, from ranging from smaller features to larger uh, representations but all of this happens uh, by the neural network training process where we don't really need to influence um, what is being looked at in the image. So in, in summary, using computer vision is, is different than maybe traditional neural network computing and the objective is to, to reduce the amount of uh, these connections between neurons and the convolutional mechanism is, is a different approach solving uh, the problem of having less parameters in the network.
So jumping a little bit more into the context of what we're talking about. Um, in the middle, you see this ARM compute library slash CMCs and N, which is the topic of today. And um, then there's the ARM and N layer on top of it, which is an abstraction layer that ARM provides in order for third party um, frameworks uh, outputs to be converted to CMCs and then, uh, suitable uh, format. So of the different contexts that you could run uh, ARM optimized code, the, the, the CPU one with the ARM Cortex-M on the lower left hand is, is the context we're talking about. And um, then there are more opportunities to accelerate um, compute on a Cortex M, uh, Cortex A with Neon, and obviously on a Mali GPU. And then there are there's uh, custom hardware that runs neural network uh, inference available also. So moving to the next slide, and we're going to go back to just basics of the, the computer vision, but very specific, specifically to the model that we're going to be running here on the uh, Cortex-M7. <clears throat> so this network consists of <clears throat> three convolutional layers, and each convolutional layer is followed by a, a pooling layer. So there's a convolutional layer one followed by a max pooling layer one, uh, and we repeat this for, for three times. And as you can see, there's this uh, uh, reduction of dimension uh, on, say, one plane. And then um, it ends up in a fully connected layer, which we're describing here with, a, with the red dots at the right-hand side at the very end of the network. So the input of the images is on the left hand, and uh, it travels through from left to right, and the softmax layer on the right, uh, very right of the screen, is the, the classification layer, which would then be the output saying car, uh, bird, deer, and so on. So th this relatively simple, in today's terms, network achieves 80% uh, accuracy. So um, it's um, it, it's quite efficient in what it uh, accomplishes. So, um, looking again closer at the, the same network that was shown uh, on the previous slide, this slide is trying to give you a little bit of uh, appreciation of what each layer has to do from a compute perspective. And uh, the column on the right is the amount of time spent on, uh, on each layer. And as you can notice, the, the pooling layers are not the, the bottleneck here. Uh, pool 1 is 1.6 milliseconds, and pool 3 is 0 0.2. So obviously, the convolutional steps are the expensive ones. Um, but it, it's not as straightforward as saying the operation count uh, directly correlates with uh, how much runtime it needs. For example, con comparing convolutional 1 with convolutional 2, uh, it, um, the runtime expense is, is not linear. But overall, the message here is that um, just running the convolutional operations on an M7 uh, results in about 100 milliseconds. So you could easily get, if you're the only thing you were doing with this device, uh, running this network, you'd get 10 frames per second, uh, which, which is pretty good. So on the, the upper right-hand corner, there's a picture of the board that we're going to be running. Um, so trying to give you a little bit of a feel of 
what exactly CMC's Anon layer uh, is. It's, it's ARM optimized code. And um, the, the convolutional bullet and the pooling bullet are, are a bit, um, um, say, not so straightforward to maybe uh, intuitively understand of why the efficiency gain is there. But on the activation side, the, the last bullet, uh, fast lookup tables are, are intuitively easy to, to understand that how that performance may be achieved. So, on the right hand columns, there are these um, <coughs> bars where you have baseline code and then optimized kernels from, um, from the CMC's NM library. And um, the throughput um, it is uh, about 4.6 times uh, higher, and then the energy efficiency seems to be even slightly higher than than the throughput performance. Uh, apologies for the cutting of the text. I'll, I will fix that for the slides that you receive afterwards. So. The expectation here is that um, the, the Cortex-M device has SIMD instructions available, which are available on the M7 and M4, and also uh, the upcoming uh, M series. And uh, we'll also run on the Cortex-M0. So if you're not running if, you're, if you have an M3, obviously this call will, code will execute. Uh, it's just not getting the benefits of the uh, ARM highly optimized code that they've created. And um, now I will jump in to show you some of the things that, um, how to build this. So first off, um, the board we're using is the, the earlier mentioned discovery board. I have um, USB power and USB for, for JTAG connected at the bottom. Uh, the little camera board from the, the back side is here connected with the flex uh, cable to, to the board itself. And, uh, and just for the sake, of, uh, I have a picture of a frog here, but we'll, we'll look at that later. Oh no. I'll now jump uh, back to the, or we haven't even seen it, to the Kyle tool. And the things I would like to start off with is the, the pack installer. So I've now typed in uh, STM32, and I've uh, picked this board in, in the board uh, section. And on the right-hand column, I'm able to see what um, packs are available for this device. And obviously, I already created the, the demo application. Uh, the, the things I'd just like to point out that uh, we're, we're going to be using the Kyle middleware. Uh, we specifically need uh, the Ethernet, even though Ethernet is not part of this demo. I'm sending um, the labels to MQTT. And uh, also the graphical user interface libraries are used from the middleware package. Uh, if you're creating something, if you get the board and you want to just try out something, there's a very easy way of getting, for example, an, uh, web server running by just picking one of the example projects and hitting copy and you'll get a, a project in Kyle which you can then obviously compile and flash. Uh, so these example projects are fully working projects that um, are expected to work uh, without any effort. So I will close the pack installer and then jump into back to the Kyle tool. 
So the one of the things that I'd like to show that um, uh, has a kind of efficiency thing and yeah, an ease of use, if you get code from um, elsewhere, there's usually print f statements uh, placed in the code, and it would be nice to efficiently get those out of the the device. So in the Kyle tool, you're able to redirect the standard out through ITM. And ITM is a, a ARM block as part of the debugging and extracting information out of it. So it, it's a more efficient way of uh, getting print apps than, than the UART method. So configuring this and also then changing um, the ITM port settings that you are listening to the, the port zero are the ways of um, getting uh, print apps automatically uh, shown on the, the Kyle tool. Obviously, there's a, the compilation part that makes it really happen, the redirection, but um, it's um, it's easy to import someone else's code from someone to, to get things going quickly. So I'm, I'm now browsing at um, the actual neural network code here. So, so this code is, is not a, for example, TensorFlow regenerated um, um, code. It is someone uh, at ARM hand wrote the code and, and we can actually see the, the layers. So we see the convolution layer followed by the pooling layer called here in the code. Uh, the earlier mentioned uh, softmax layer is here at the end to, to classify the uh, outcome of, of the run. And um, just, just to give you maybe a little bit of um, more insight here that uh, very often when you're running uh, a model someone else has trained, you, you'll see some normalization steps taken that need to be also done uh, when you actually execute someone else's uh, network. So that, that's what you're seeing here. But very straightforward from a perspective of um, being able to understand what's going on. So now we'll jump to the uh, demo and uh, since I have it already running, we'll not um, get tied up with that. The, the normal things of um, uh, setting a breakpoint and me being able to step through code here is obviously available. Um, I will run it for the sake of you seeing some of the of the debug prints. And we're now in debugging mode. And uh, I'm going to open the, the camera window here on the side. And we're stopped at the breakpoint. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to remove it now. And we're just going to continue running. And um, You'll see some <clears throat> MQTT print apps here, but uh, we're also measuring some of the, the latency of how long it's taking for the inference to happen. So I'm going to leave um, the debug session running and just jump into the demo now. And we're in, in the image you see a larger viewfinder view of, of, of the frog. And then in the circle, you see a really tiny um, image with the percentage below it. So, so that's the size of the image that is being fed to the network. 
the 32 by 32 pixel. So the, the network was trained with that size of images and uh, this is the input it's expecting. So I'm obviously here in, in real time showing you these pictures. We, we got a frog and um, one of the categories was a deer. And um, it, um, we're bouncing a little bit, sometimes um, getting all the deer's horn structure and head helps to, it to give a really good um, classification result. So I'll show a picture of a horse. We seem to be on a roll, things are working. Um, then I'd like to show you something that that doesn't work that great normally. So the intention here, uh, intentionally picked an image where it's a little bit dark and um, even though the automobile label exists, um, this seems to be a relatively new looking SUV and, and very dark image. So it, it's not really doing that great. Just to kind of show you also that it all depends on, on your training data and lighting conditions kind of come into play. So one, one thing that um, when wanting to do this demo came to my mind is that how do I know that the, the deers and horses are not part of the training data, uh, which is a slightly annoyingly difficult problem to browse through the 5,000 images per category. So I, I picked here some uh, boats that travel be between um, Helsinki and Stockholm. The one on the top is, is a Syria line and the one is on the bottom with more green is a Tallink company ship. So I'm, I'm going to now assume that when they created this data set, they didn't have these ships. I don't know. Um, could be wrong about it. I think they're relatively new. But um, one of the points I want to make here is that um, uh, two ships in an image is more ship than one ship. So I'm also helping it in that way. But it, it would work equally well with just one ship. Um, so my final image here that I want to show is um, a container. And a container is... Um, not part of the 10 categories that we've seen uh, as part of CIFAR 10 dataset. However, I'm sure in the dataset there are a lot of ships carrying containers. So therefore, uh, a container is something that um, from a feature extraction level is something that is expected to be seen in a, a ship a picture of a ship. I mean, it's one of them. Not, not uh, every ship needs to have containers. In them. So this is really where I wanted to leave you and, and get you excited to give this a try for yourself. Um, you, you can see on the bottom of the corner, we're updating the screen once every second. It could run faster than what it runs here, but uh, from a demo perspective, it's better if it doesn't flicker too much. Um, so yeah, it's uh, Cortex M7 uh, running a neural network with, um, let's say, reasonable performance. And um, if you have uh, questions related to this demo, uh, please be in contact with me. And um, I think um, Marty will also say some final words, and, but thank you all for joining. Thanks, Levi, and we have some questions in, in the chat box, so we can go through them quickly. Is the webinar recorded? Yes, and we will send the link to you afterwards. And uh, another question was that, are these data sets freely available? Kalevi, I guess yes, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. The data sets are... Um, there's usually a website for each data set, so it's really easy to, to see. Uh, if you just type in CIFAR-10, you'll, you'll quickly...
quickly get to the, the web page. Uh, often these are academic institutions that have created them. Uh, yeah. I'm also now first time looking at the chat window. There's a question about um, is computation done in 8 bit from Conman Ushul? Yes, the, the, the weights have been quantized. Um, and But a, a comment on that that um, the CMC's Annan library also has ready made 16 bit um, uh, kernels available. So that's the kind of thing you need to decide uh, which. Um, which um, what what do you have available? But um, the floating point is, is typically not the thing that is being done on on this um, category of devices, just, just from the sheer size of uh, it. So the eight bit quantization just saves so much of the memory bandwidth. Thanks for the question. And there's one. How much memory does the result of the training takes for this demo? Um, I, I think we have it on the slide, and if I'm now just, I think it was like 110. Um, okay, I, I need to look at the slide, but it's definitely mentioned in the slides. I don't want to. <laughs> Say the numbers because I'm going to get them wrong. Um, so this, um, uh, yeah, I so, sorry I can't um, give the number right now, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's mentioned on the slide where we have the different um, uh, time for each uh, each layer takes to to execute. And I will provide the slides also with the recording. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, everyone for joining for this webinar. And, and I hope that we see you in the future. Okay. Thank you. And bye now. Bye bye.